Aren't you glad there's someone to turn to for help? Just think if there wasn't a God, what would we do? We'd have no source of help. The psalmist said, He that helpeth Israel, helpeth Israel, neither sleeps nor doth he slumber, but his ears are open to their cries. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? It's good to have those special visitors that Brian recognized, and it's also good to have Sister Brock here after her illness, so good to have her here. And uh, I want to thank you, thank the board and the church for the birthday wishes. I had not listened to that, that they sent me. i tell you what we could do here. Here we go, here we go. I'm surprised. That's pretty good. That guy's being sabotaged on the sound there. Thank you, brothers. I I, I wonder what all went on back there. <laughs> I didn't know you had a singing career out the back there. But thank you, church. Appreciate that. Don't forget our service this evening. Let's pray that the Lord would minister in a special way. We have this. Uh, Lord's Supper before us today and I like for the Lord to move in a special way making himself real to our hearts this morning and I would ask you to turn to Genesis 22 we're going to be in keeping with our promise series but we're going to have two emphasis this morning one is communion I chose this promise for communion secondly because we're entering the Christmas season and all of this about the Christmas season is about the fact that our Savior came. Amen. I would venture to say on on television commercials, radio commercials, you'll not have any references to the Nativity this year. No references to the coming Christ. But that's what it's all about. Our Savior has come. Hallelujah. Thank you. If you'd stand for the reading of God's Word, then leave your Scripture open. Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, verse 7, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And Isaac said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where is the lamb? Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. This promise is spoken from the words of Abraham during the time of duress. He's about to offer his only son, his only son of promise, as a sacrifice and obedience to God. And Abraham gave the promise, God will provide a lamb. God himself will provide a lamb. I want to preach this morning on the promise of the lamb. Hallelujah. Jesus, make yourself real in this place. Anoint with your Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. On that eventful day when they took Jesus before Pilate, Pilate could find no fault with him. And he went out to tell the crowd that. He went out and said and to the Jews, I find in him no fault at all. Then Pilate said, But ye have a custom that I should release one unto you at the Passover. 
Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? But they cried out and said, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. You see, on the day that Jesus was crucified, there were three robbers that were to die, to be crucified upon the cross. Two of them were crucified that day, but the third was released at the crowd's bidding. They chose a robber to be set free over the innocent Son of God. And on that middle cross where Barabbas should have hanged, hanged an innocent man, hanged Jesus, the Son of God, hanged a lamb. I got to thinking about that. I don't know if Barabbas hung around long enough to see that sight. But if he did, it had to occur to him as he looked at that figure, that bleeding figure on the middle cross, it had to occur to him, that was the cross I was supposed to be hanging from. That should have been me on that cross. Whoever that is, they're dying in my place on my cross. Barabbas at that awareness should have wondered in amazement that Jesus had taken his place on the cross. I don't know if Barabbas hung around or not, but he should have been no more amazed than we should be because, see, that cross was our cross too. And Jesus, when he hung there on the cross, he was in fact taking our place. He was a substitute for us. Aren't you glad for the Lamb that took our place? You see, in what I've read to you this morning, this test of Abraham's faith was God giving humanity a picture of what He was going to do to save them. And in a nutshell, what God was going to do to save mankind was to provide a Lamb to be the substitute to take their place. Now we're looking back on that. They were looking forward. But we're looking back and I can say this morning, God did provide a lamb. And that lamb did take our place. And he did die in our stead. And he did shed his blood in our place. And because of him, we did go free. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for the lamb of God? Praise his name. You see, in this passage, I see, first of all, the picture of God. You see, some say this parallel about what happened between Abraham and Isaac and what happened with Christ is only coincidence. I don't believe it's coincidence. I believe God chose this to happen to be a picture to us of the coming Lamb and of who God is. But in verse 1, I read to you that God did tempt Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. And God said, now listen, this is important. He said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. Notice what he says, take thine only son. This is the only son of promise from Sarah. But take thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Abraham, you're a father. You love that boy. You love Isaac. But take him and offer him a sacrifice. I want you to know when Abraham received this commandment from God, I'm sure that consternation and confusion pummeled his mind and his heart. Why? Well, first of all, Abraham knew his God. And this command to kill his son as a sacrifice contradicted all Abraham knew about God. He knew that God was a God of life and not of death. And beyond that, Abraham had been told by God that it was through Isaac that God was going to raise up a nation through Isaac's descendants and and give Abraham this, this blessing and this promise. And now God is telling him to take that son of promise and do an unspeakable thing. Kill him. Crucify him. And yet it's in this commandment that we get a picture of God because Abraham, though he didn't understand it, he was willing to sacrifice his only son whom he loved so dearly. He was willing to give that son up. And it's in that picture that we have a a picture of God 
who had an only begotten son and he loved him so so completely and yet the father sent that son to be the savior to be the lamb Amen. I know we've heard it over and over, but could I read it to you one more time in the context of this picture of Abraham taking his only beloved son to crucify him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm telling you, the father loved the son. It's his only begotten son, but he gave him that we might have eternal life and so in Abraham taking Isaac to crucify him we have a picture of God the Father then I want you to see in the story there's a place in history verse 3 and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him listen then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off God said crucify your son and I'll show you the place just you head off you head out in that direction and I'll show you the place for you to crucify him and while they were a long ways off, God said, see that hilltop over there? That's the hilltop I want you to crucify your son on. Now there's some surmising here which hilltop that is. All it tells us here, it's the land of Moriah. But we can have a pretty good indication it was one or two hilltops there. One was the hilltop that became the Temple Mount. Centuries later, God would point out that same hilltop and say, build my temple there. The other hilltop would be the one that history tells us is Golgotha. There's a bit of surmising there. The Bible doesn't tell us for sure which one it is in location. But those that know the terrain would say another hilltop in the direction God pointed was Golgotha where the cross of Christ stood. You see, it doesn't really matter which hilltop because the lesson is the same. If Abraham had offered Isaac on the what would to be the temple mount, that would only mean he offered him at the very spot where they would bring literally thousands upon thousands of lambs and slit their throats and shed their blood for the sins of the people. And every time they slit the throat of another lamb on that hilltop at the place that Isaac had been offered, every time they slit another throat, they were only prophesying that one day there would come to the temple the lamb who would shed his blood for the remission of sins. Perhaps it was Golgotha. Perhaps it was that very place where Abraham offered Isaac that one day that cross would jolt into the ground, that cross that bore Jesus, the Lamb. We don't know for sure, but it struck me this time through the story that it probably was Golgotha. Most would lean towards him. The Temple Mount, well, we can take that from scholars, but if historians are true, and Golgotha is the hill that they point to. Golgotha is taller than the Temple Mount. And so if you're at a distance, and God points and says that hilltop right there, the first hilltop you're going to see is Golgotha. I don't know which one it is. One thing I'm certain of, the hilltop that ought to rise the tallest in each of our lives ought to be the hilltop of Golgotha. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. But I want you to know God had picked the place. He said, that's the place I want you to crucify Isaac. And what I'm trying to say here, we're talking about geography, geology. In other words, this really did happen in history. 
It's not a myth. It's not a legend. There was a place, a place where a lamb took Isaac's place. And I want you to know, just as real, there is a place in history where the lamb took our place. And beyond that, there ought to be the place in every one of our lives that we could point to and say, it's at that place. The blood washed me. It's at that place. I accepted the fact that Jesus took my place and I became born again clean and forgiven can you point to the place the old song says I could take you to where it happened so could Isaac we may not know what hilltop that was that the lamb took Isaac's place but Isaac knew and you too will know that place where you allow Christ to be your savior then I want you to notice this remarkable proclamation of faith verse 5 and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here with the donkey, and, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Listen to this faith here. And come again to you. Listen, I don't believe at this point, if, if my, my knowledge serves me correctly, I don't believe in biblical history or history at that point there had ever been a resurrection. I don't think that there had been ever a promise of resurrection. And yet Abraham foresaw God's ability to raise from the dead. He headed up that hillside fully intending to obey God and crucify his son. And at the same time, though he fully intended to kill his son, Abraham had a faith that Isaac was coming back with him off that hilltop. Tell me that's not faith. By faith, Abraham, please God, what a faith. To believe you're going to take the life of your son. And yet he said to his two servant lads, he said, you hold this donkey because my son and I are going up that mountain to sacrifice. And we, not me, but we will come again. Oh, what a proclamation of faith. I don't know how he saw the resurrection, but he did. Hebrews 11 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had that received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Hallelujah. Now we're going to find out that didn't happen. Isaac didn't get killed, and God didn't raise him from the dead. However, once again, by faith, Abraham saw something that would happen. There would be a day at that location where they would take a lamb and they would kill that lamb. Oh, but that lamb did not stay dead because God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. And that's why his blood is able to wash and forgive and to cleanse. What a proclamation. The slain lamb would rise from the dead. And then I want to talk about the problem with the lamb. Look at verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. They're climbing the hill. Verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. He said, Here am I, my son. Listen to the question. Isaac said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb? Father, we're going to sacrifice. We have wood, we have fire, but we don't have the sacrifice. <coughs> I think there's a continuation of the picture here. And again, I don't think this is coincident. But notice, you know, you have to have wood to burn the sacrifice. And Abraham gathered up the kindling he had clave or he had split and he tied it in a bundle and he put it upon Isaac's back. Think about it. Isaac was carrying the wood that he would lay upon when he was sacrificed. And no differently, the ultimate lamb 
carried the wood. He carried the cross upon which he would be sacrificed. Hallelujah. What a Savior. I said, what a Savior. Can you imagine the workings of Isaac's mind? I don't know how many steps they climbed up that mountain before it dawned on Isaac. And he asked the question, we have wood, we have flint, we have charcoal for fire, but where's the lamb? But I want you to know Isaac might have been the first to ask it. But his question would echo through the ages for 2,000 more years. Where is the lamb? There were people that didn't even know how to form the question, where is the lamb? There were people in lost societies that we no longer know about in places here and there across the earth feeling the burden of guilt and sin, wanting a relief from that guilt and sin. They didn't even know how to form the question, but the question cry of their heart was, where is the lamb? Where is the thing, the one that can take away this guilt, this sin, this bondage, this darkness, there's blackness. And even for those in the economy of God that God taught to take a lamb to first the tabernacle and then the temple, even as they were taking that lamb to have its throat slit and to have its blood shed for them, even as they laid their hands on that little lamb they brought, they knew that the shedding of that animal's blood would just release their record and cleanse their record for a year to come but they knew they'd leave with the same guilt and the same stain and the same sin on their heart. Their record would be cleared for the moment, but their heart was still heavy. And so even though they were dragging a lamb to the tabernacle, to the temple, as they walked into the temple, they were still asking, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? We're not there yet, but I'm so glad we're looking at it from the other side and we can see the lamb. We know when he came. Hallelujah. If you're thankful for the Lamb of God, well, don't you praise Him. That's one of the praises of heaven. Oh, behold the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Where is the Lamb? Then I want you to look at the promise of the Lamb. Verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide, or God Himself will provide a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, I don't know what Abraham was thinking. I just know how it comes out in Scripture. He may be thinking, as he already indicated, that the lamb God provides is Isaac. And even though He's going to kill him and burn him with fire, God's going to raise Isaac up. And so he's thinking... Isaac, don't you you don't realize it, but you're you're the lamb that God provides. I don't know if that, or maybe he began to have a little faith that God was going to provide a substitute for Isaac. All he knew is though he didn't understand the command to kill his son, he trusted in God. And God said, Have a sacrifice, so there was going to be a sacrifice. And if it took a lamb to have a sacrifice, there was going to be a lamb. And God told him it was going to be Isaac. God would provide the lamb. Now, I want you to notice the emphasis here. God will provide. You see, I talked to you about them taking lambs to the tabernacle and temple. But those were lambs that they provided. I know ultimately God provides all things, but they provided. That was a lamb from their flock. That was a lamb they bought at the market. That man provided his lamb. That's not the lamb Abraham's talking about. He said, the lamb, God will provide it. And so here I am, an Israelite. I can take the lamb I got out of my flock or I bought at the market. I can take it to the tabernacle and slaughter it. But that's not the lamb. That's my lamb. That's not the lamb of God. But Abraham's promise was true. God would provide a lamb. Let's look at the provision of the lamb. Verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there. And he laid the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son. 
and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. It'd be much bigger than this, but he took his knife to slay the son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham! And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the lamb and offered him up, a burnt offering, get these words, in the stead of, or in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mouth of the Lord, it shall be seen. That was only the first thing that was seen in the mouth of the Lord. I'm telling you in obedience, Abraham tied up Isaac like he had tied up an animal lamb. He picked Isaac up and laid him. Some said Isaac was big enough he had to crawl up there himself and then Abraham tied him up. But here's Isaac bound on top the wood of the altar. And Abraham has lifted up his knife to plunge it into his own son. Amen. You fathers, can you imagine the agony, the pain, the grief, the crisis of faith to know that with a downward plunge you're about to take the life of your son. But suddenly, right before you begin the downward motion, God speaks and says, wait a moment, hold it. Your son doesn't have to die because I've provided a substitute. Look over there in the bushes and there's a lamb. Get your son off that altar. Put that lamb on there. Your son's not dying. That lamb is. I'm telling you, the same thing happened to us. We were bound in sin upon the the altar deserving of the judgments and wrath and punishment of God but before death eternal death came God said wait a minute you don't have to die look right there behold the lamb he'll take your place hallelujah let's worship the lamb hallelujah can you imagine the joy the joy when Abraham tossed aside the knife, untied the ropes that bound Isaac, lifted him off the altar. Can you imagine the thrill when they tied that lamb up to take Isaac's place? We look at this rightfully from Abraham's view, as I just did. What a relief to that father. He no longer has to kill his son. But I want you for a moment to look at it from Isaac's point of view. He's looking up at that knife, wondering, expecting it to come plunging into him at any moment. Amen. Can you imagine the fear, the fright, the anticipation tied up, unable to move? But from Isaac's point of view, suddenly he hears that weight. There is a lamb. He's just been at that close to death. Now he's being untied. Now he's been taken from the place of death. Now a lamb has taken his place. Do you remember when that was you? You knew you deserved to die. But suddenly, when you believed and trusted in Christ, suddenly you're being untied. You're being set free. You're being liberated because a lamb has taken your place. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Isaac was first to ask the question, where is the lamb? I told you for 2,000 years that echoed through the world. Every civilization, every tongue, every color of people, every corner of the globe, where is the Lamb? Sin sick, where is the Lamb? Tired of the darkness, where is the Lamb? Tired of destruction, where is the Lamb? 2,000 years, where is the Lamb? Where is the Lamb? Then one day, hallelujah, Standing on the banks of Jordan River, a man clothed in rough clothing at the nudging of the Holy Spirit looked up and saw in the thick vegetation of the bank of Jordan 
he looked up and he said there he is there he is behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world and ever since no preacher no believer has had to ask the question where's the lamb since then all of us have been able to say there he is behold the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world oh hallelujah that's what he came to do that's what he does hallelujah aren't you glad you've seen the lamb Every communion should be a time of realizing that we were bound by our sin. We deserved to die. We were slated for judgment and death. But the Father sent the Lamb to be the Savior of the world. In this communion today, we ought to remember that the Lamb took our place. When we gaze at this cross this morning, we should remember how the Lamb suffered there. <coughs> Do you see Him on the altar where you were bound, on the cross that you earned? Can you truly say this morning, He took my place? I would say with Peter as we approach this communion, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things or as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition by your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Praise God and the lamb forever. What are we going to be doing in heaven? Praise God and the lamb forever. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And I want to tell you this morning, you cannot provide the lamb for yourself. No amount of good works, no amount of doing good things as noble and commendable as they are, no amount of your own personal suffering can ever provide salvation. The only one that can provide salvation is the lamb the Lamb that the Father sent. Would you come, music? I wasn't aware of the song, but a friend happened to be talking to me this week, and he, he told me about a song. In the song, it's in the time of Christ. A man has taken his two sons to Jerusalem for the first time to participate in Passover. And when they leave home, they select a lamb. They select a lamb to take with them, the two sons and the father. They make it to Jerusalem, and the dad said when he entered in, he knew something was wrong. Instead of the normal jubilee, there was angry shouts in the street. He knew something was going on, and he listened, and the people were shouting, Crucify him. Since they had left home, all along that journey and now as they entered the streets of Jerusalem that father had kept saying to those two young sons watch the lamb that's our sacrifice that's going to be important when we get to Jerusalem watch the lamb watch the lamb and now they're in that tumult and the people are crying crucify him watch the lamb he says to the two boys and then here comes the Savior, they've beaten. He's bleeding, walking, carrying a cross. He stumbles. And the Roman soldier grabs and shouts at the man with the two boys and commands him to carry the cross. A lot of the song is that story of his carrying the cross, but as he's carrying the cross, he can't keep up with his two boys and the lamb. Of course, we know him to be Simon. They get to the place of crucifixion and he, he drops the cross down and they throw Jesus on it. And, and the man's watching as they drive the spikes into Jesus' body. He's, he, he's thinking about the awful suffering. And they raise the cross and he's caught up with that. And, and then in the song he says he feels his two sons 
pulling at his hands. And he turns his attention to him. He says to his boys, what? And in the, in the confusion, they, they looked at him and said, Dad, we lost the lamb. You told us to watch it, but we lost the lamb. And the man said, oh, no. He said, look at the cross. He said, watch the lamb. Watch the lamb, the one God had provided. Hallelujah. Are your eyes on the lamb this morning? Maybe you've heard the gospel a hundred times. But you've been trying to provide your own lamb. Can't do it. Only his blood, the blood of the perfect, sinless lamb, can cleanse from sin. Hallelujah. I'd like to invite you to turn your eyes to the lamb. Would you lift your hearts and hands in worship? Would you praise him across the building? Servers, would you come? Hallelujah. Let's praise him. Come on, let's look to the Lamb. Look to the Lamb of God. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Oh, look to... If you're here this morning, you're without Christ, you're without salvation. Maybe you're trusting in your own Lamb, your own good works. Don't do that. Every one of us needs the substitute. We need the one who has taken our place. We need Jesus. <laughs> Turn to him. Look to him even in his communion service. Look to him. We need the Lamb of God. Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, thy Lord. The answer I may never know. Why he luck ever loved me so? But to an old rugged cross he go, for who am I? When I think of how he came so far from glory, to dwell among the lowly such as I to suffer shame and such disgrace on Mount Calvary take my place then I asked myself the question, Who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and died for? Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, thy Lord. The answer I may never know. Why he ever loved me so? But to an old rugged cross he go for who am I? When 
I'm reminded of his words, I'll leave him never. If you be true, I'll give to you life forever. wonder what I could have done to deserve God's only Son. But to an old rugged cross he go, for who am I? King would bleed and died for. Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, thy Lord. The answer I may never know. Why he ever loved me so That to an old rugged cross He'd go for who am I When I'm reminded of his words I'll leave him never If you be true I'll give to you Life forever I want what I could have done to deserve God's only Son To fight my battles until they're won For who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and died for who am I that he would pray not my will thy Lord the answer I may never know why he ever loved me so That to an old rugged cross he go For who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and died for who am I that he would pray not my will thy Lord the answer I may never know why he ever loved me so But to an old rugged cross He'd go for who am I Someone said you folk make it all about the blood Is there a good reason for that? It is all about the blood Without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins but he paid it all amen aren't you glad for that saved sins forgiven because he provided the lamb could you stand across the building 
Amen. Peace the Lord. Roger Dale, you asked a blessing on the bread. Shall we partake together? We're about to partake of the cup, and as we do, remember the Lamb. Remember the Lamb. Amen. Brother Fraley, would you ask the Lord's blessing on the cup? Amen. May we partake together. Give thanks for the Lamb. Give thanks for the Lamb. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings His praise again. Hallelujah, oh, praise the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings His praise again. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's praise the land without reservation. We give all the credit, all the glory, all the praise to Him. Hallelujah, praise the land. Oh, if you need Him this morning, these altars are open. If you need salvation, would you come? The Lamb is here. He's taken your place. Would you receive it? Would you not accept it? Hallelujah. Oh, praise Him without reservation. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Glory. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God and the Lamb forever. The question's been answered. Where is the Lamb? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. Lord, we do praise you. Minister by your Spirit. Make yourself real across every part of this congregation. You are the Lamb. You did it all. You paid the price. You suffered. You bled. You gave. You died. You rose again. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the Lamb of God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Worthy to be worshipped. Worthy to be praised. Worthy to be honored. Oh, we praise you, Lamb of God. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. May we enter into his house tonight with thanksgiving and praise and let the Lord continue to move in our hearts. In Bible times, a very important part of the Lord's Supper was greeting one another. And you guys greet one another and show your love one to another this morning. God go with you. God bless you. Amen.